Section 1 of Four Weird Tales by Algernon Blackwood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Four Weird Tales by Algernon Blackwood. The Insanity of Jones. A Study in Incarnation. Chapter 1. Adventures come to the adventurous and mysterious things fall in the way of those who, with wonder and imagination, are on the watch for them. But the majority of people go past the doors that are half ajar, thinking them closed, and fail to notice the faint stirrings of the great curtain that hangs ever in the form of appearances between them and the world of causes behind. For only to the few whose inner senses have been quickened, perchance by some strange suffering in the depths, or by a natural temperament bequeathed from a remote past, comes the knowledge, not too welcome, that this greater world lies ever at their elbow, and that any moment a chance combination of moods and forces may invite them to cross the shifting frontier. Some, however, are born with this awful certainty in their hearts, and are called to no apprenticeship, and to this select company Jones undoubtedly belonged. All his life he had realised that his senses brought to him merely a more or less interesting set of sham appearances, that space, as men measure it, was utterly misleading, that time, as the clock ticked it in a succession of minutes, was arbitrary nonsense, and in fact that all his sensory perceptions were but a clumsy representation of real things behind the curtain, things he was forever trying to get at, and that sometimes he actually did get at. He had always been tremblingly aware that he stood on the borderland of another region, a region where time and space were merely forms of thought, where ancient memories lay open to the sight, and where the forces behind each human life stood plainly revealed, and he could see the hidden springs at the very heart of the world. Moreover, the fact that he was a clerk in a fire insurance office, and did his work with strict attention, never allowed him to forget for one moment that, just beyond the dingy brick walls where the hundred men scribbled with pointed pens beneath the electric lamps, there existed this glorious region where the important part of himself dwelt and moved and had its being. For in this region, he pictured himself playing the part of a spectator to his ordinary workaday life, watching like a king the stream of events, but untouched in his own soul by the dirt, the noise, and the vulgar commotion of the outer world. And this was no poetic dream merely. Jones was not playing prettily with idealism to amuse himself. It was a living, working belief. So convinced was he that the external world was the result of a vast deception practised upon him by the gross senses, that when he stared at a great building like St. Paul's, he felt it would not very much surprise him to see it suddenly quiver like shape of a jelly, and then melt utterly away, while in its place stood all at once revealed the mass of colour, or the great intricate vibrations, or the splendid sound, the spiritual idea, which it represented in stone. For something in this way it was that his mind worked. Yet to all appearances, and in the satisfaction of all business claims, Jones was normal and unenterprising. He felt nothing but contempt for the wave of modern psychism. He hardly knew the meaning of such words as clairvoyance and clairaudience. He had never felt the least desire to join the Theosophical Society and to speculate in theories of astral plane life or elements. He attended no meetings of the Psychical Research Society, and knew no anxiety as to whether his aura was black or blue, nor was he conscious of the slightest wish to mix in with the revival of cheap occultism which proves so attractive to weak minds of mystical tendencies and unleashed imaginations. There were certain things he knew, but none he cared to argue about, and he shrank instinctively from attempting to put names to the contents of this other region knowing well that such names could only limit and define things that, according to any standards in use in the ordinary world, were simply undefinable and elusive. So that, although this was the way his mind worked, there was clearly a very strong leaven of common sense in Jones. In a word, the man 
the world and the office knew as Jones was Jones. The name summed him up and labelled him correctly. John Enderby Jones. Among the things that he knew, and therefore never cared to speak or speculate about, one was that he plainly saw himself as the inheritor of a long series of past lives, the net result of painful evolution, always as himself, of course, but in numerous different bodies, each determined by the behaviour of the preceding one. The present John Jones was the last result to date of all the previous thinking, feeling, and doing of John Jones in earlier bodies and in other centuries. He pretended no details, nor claimed distinguished ancestry, for he realised his past must have been utterly commonplace and insignificant to have produced his present. But he was just as sure he had been at this weary game for ages as that he breathed, and that it never occurred to him to argue, to doubt, or to ask questions. And one result of this belief was that his thoughts dwelt upon the past rather than upon the future, that he read much history, and felt specially drawn to certain periods whose spirit he understood instinctively as though he had lived in them, and that he found all religions uninteresting, because, almost without exception, they start from the present and speculate ahead as to what men shall become, instead of looking back and speculating why men have got here as they are. In the insurance office he did his work exceedingly well, but without much personal ambition. Men and women he regarded as the impersonal instruments for inflicting upon him the pain or pleasure he had earned by his past workings, for chance had no place in his scheme of things at all, and while he recognised that the practical world could not get along unless every man did his work thoroughly and conscientiously, he took no interest in the accumulation of fame or money for himself, and simply therefore did his plain duty with indifference as to results. In common with others who lead strictly impersonal life, he possessed the quality of utter bravery, and was always ready to face any combination of circumstances, no matter how terrible, because he saw in them the just working out of past causes he had himself set in motion, which could not be dodged or modified. And whereas the majority of people had little meaning for him, either by way of attraction or repulsion, the moment he met someone with whom he felt his past had been vitally interwoven, his whole inner being leaped up instantly and shouted the fact in his face, and he regulated his life with the utmost skill and caution, like a sentry on watch for an enemy whose feet could already be heard approaching. Thus, while the great majority of men and women left him uninfluenced, since he regarded them as so many souls merely passing with him along the great stream of evolution, there were, here and there, individuals with whom he recognised that his smallest intercourse was of the gravest importance. These were persons with whom he knew in every fibre of his being he had accounts to settle, pleasant or otherwise, arising out of dealings in past lives, and in his relations with these few, therefore, he concentrated as it were the efforts that most people spread over their intercourse with a far greater number. By what means he picked out these few individuals, only those conversant with the startling process of the subconscious memory may say, but the point was that Jones believed the main purpose, if not quite the entire purpose, of his present incarnation lay in his faithful and thorough settling of these accounts, and that if he sought to evade the least detail of such settling, no matter how unpleasant, he would have lived in vain, and would return to his next incarnation with his added duty to perform. For according to his beliefs there was no chance, and could be no ultimate shirking, and to avoid a problem was merely to waste time and lose opportunities for development. And there was one individual with whom Jones had long understood clearly that he had a very large account to settle, and towards the accomplishment of which all the main currents of his being seemed to bear him with unswerving purpose. For when he first entered the insurance office as a junior clerk ten years before, and through a glass door he had caught sight of this man seated in an inner room, one of his sudden overwhelming flashes of intuitive memory had burst up into him from the depths, and he had seen, as in a flame of blinding light, a symbolic picture of the future rising out of a dreadful past— and he had, without any act of definite volition, marked down this man for a real account to be settled. 
"'With that man I shall have much to do,' he said to himself, as he noticed the big face look up and meet his eye through a glass. "'There is something I cannot shirk, a vital relation out of the past of both of us.' And he went to his desk, trembling a little, and with shaking knees, as though the memory of some terrible pain had suddenly laid its icy hand upon his heart and touched the scar of a great horror. It was a moment of genuine terror when their eyes had met through the glass door, and he was conscious of an inward shrinking and loathing that seized upon him with great violence and convinced him, in a single second, that the settling of this account would be almost, perhaps, more than he could manage. The vision passed as swiftly as it came, dropping back again into the submerged region of his consciousness, but he never forgot it, and the whole of his life thereafter became a sort of natural, though undeliberate, preparation for the fulfilment of the great duty when the time should be ripe. In those days, ten years ago, this man was the assistant manager, but had since been promoted as manager to one of the company's local branches, and soon afterwards Jones had likewise found himself transferred to the same branch. A little later again, the branch at Liverpool, one of the most important, had been in peril owing to mismanagement and defalcation, and the man had gone to take charge of it, and again, by mere chance, apparently, Jones had been promoted to the same place. And this pursuit of the assistant manager had continued for several years, often, too, in the most curious fashion, and though Jones had never exchanged a single word with him, or had been so much as noticed, indeed, by the great man, the clerk understood perfectly well that these moves in the game were all part of a definite purpose. Never for one moment did he doubt that the invisibles behind the veil were slowly and surely arranging the details of it all, so as to lead up suitably to the climax demanded by justice, a climax in which himself and the manager would play the leading roles. "'It is inevitable,' he said to himself, "'and I feel it may be terrible.' When the moment comes, I shall be ready, and I pray God that I may face it properly and act like a man. Moreover, as the years passed and nothing happened, he felt the horror closing in upon him with a steady increase. For the fact was, Jones hated and loathed the manager with an intensity of feeling he had never before experienced toward any human being. He shrank from his presence and from the glance of his eyes, as though he remembered to have suffered nameless cruelties at his hands, and he slowly began to realise, moreover, that the matter to be settled between them was one of very ancient standing, and that the nature of the settlement was a discharge of accumulated punishment which would probably be very dreadful in the manner of its fulfilment. When, therefore, the chief cashier one day informed him that the man was to be in London again, this time as general manager of the head office, and said that he was charged to find a private secretary for him among the best clerks, and further intimated that the selection had fallen upon himself, Jones accepted the promotion quietly, fatalistically, yet with a degree of inward loathing hardly to be described, for he saw in this merely another move in the evolution of the inevitable nemesis, which he simply dared not seek to frustrate by any personal consideration, and at the same time he was conscious of a certain feeling of relief that the suspense of waiting might soon be mitigated. A secret sense of satisfaction, therefore, accompanied the unpleasant change, and Jones was able to hold himself perfectly well in hand when it was carried into effect, and he was formally introduced as private secretary to the general manager. Now, the manager was a large, fat man, with a very red face and bags beneath his eyes. Being short-sighted, he wore glasses that seemed to magnify his eyes, which were always a little bloodshot. In hot weather a sort of thin slime covered his cheeks, for he perspired easily. His head was almost entirely bald, and over his turned-down collar his great neck folded in two distinct reddish collops of flesh. His hands were big, and his fingers almost massive in thickness. He was an excellent businessman, of sane judgment and firm will, without enough imagination to confuse his course of action by showing him possible alternatives— and his integrity and ability caused him to be held in universal respect by the world of business and finance. In the important regions of a man's character, however, and at heart he was coarse, brutal almost to savagery, without consideration for others, and, as a result, often cruelly unjust to his helpless subordinates. 
In moments of temper, which were not infrequent, his face turned a dull purple, while the top of his bald head shone by contrast like white marble, and the bags under his eyes swelled till it seemed they would presently explode with a pop, and at these times he presented a distinctly repulsive appearance. But to a private secretary like Jones, who did his duty regardless of whether his employer was a beast or an angel, and whose mainspring was principle and not emotion, this made little difference. Within the narrow limits in which any one could satisfy such a man, he pleased the general manager, and more than once his piercing intuitive faculty, amounting almost to clairvoyance, assisted the chief in a fashion that served to bring the two closer together than might otherwise have been the case, and caused the man to respect in his assistant a power of which he possessed not even the germ himself. It was a curious relationship that grew up between the two, and the cashier, who enjoyed the credit of having made the selection, profited by it indirectly as much as any one else. So, for some time, the work of the office continued normally, and very prosperously. John Enderby Jones received a good salary, and in outward appearance of the two chief characters in this history, there was little change noticeable, except that the manager grew fatter and redder, and the secretary observed that his own hair was beginning to show rather greyish at the temples. There were, however, two changes in progress, and they both had to do with Jones, and are important to mention. One was that he began to dream evilly. In the region of deep sleep, where the possibility of significant dreaming first develops itself, he was tormented more and more with the vivid scenes and pictures, in which a tall, thin man, dark and sinister of countenance, and with bad eyes, was closely associated with himself. Only the setting was that of a past age, with costumes of centuries gone by, and the scenes had to do with dreadful cruelties that could not belong to the modern life as he knew it. The other chain was also significant, but is not so easy to describe, for he had in fact become aware that some new portion of himself, hitherto unawaked, had stirred slowly into life out of the very depths of his consciousness. This new part of himself amounted almost to another personality, and he never observed its least manifestation without a strange thrill at his heart, for he understood that it had begun to watch the manager. End of chapter 1 of The Insanity of Jones, A Study in Reincarnation